Okay, I think it's time to begin. So let me just start by welcoming everyone to this week's uh, uh, Brock Coast Institute seminar. And I'm going to pass the floor over to uh, Professor David Latulit to uh, introduce our speaker for this evening, who is joining us from, from France, spending his Friday night with us uh, today. Okay, David. Thanks, Alex. Uh, okay, so uh, everyone, thank you for uh, for joining in on our uh, second seminar within this uh, membrane series that we organized. We had uh, Professor Bill Phillip join us two weeks ago, and and now we have uh, uh, Charles Delanois uh, who's going to be presenting. So Charles uh, joined uh, the the chemical engineering department at McMaster in uh, in 2016. He's been uh, doing an incredible job leading this, this group in developing uh, electrochemical membranes and sorbents. I've had the, the pleasure of, of collaborating with him on a number of projects and uh, it, it's really been a pleasure doing that, seeing how he uh, engages with industry, uh, does a great job of mentoring students. And uh, today we're gonna hear about this sort of suite of technologies that, uh, that they've been developing. Um, and so uh, with that, turn over to Charles. At the end, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, to answer, to ask uh, some questions. So Charles, take it over. All right, thanks David for that introduction. <clears throat> and uh, you know, I really appreciate being part of BIMR when I am missing out on Friday night in France where the streets are full of wine <laughs> and great food. Uh, I'll get to that shortly, but uh, that's how much I love uh, being part of BIMR. I think this is a fantastic society. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Delanois. I'm an associate professor now of chemical engineering. And uh, as Professor Latulip mentioned, we do a lot of work on electrochemistry combined with membrane technology and uh, sorbents, uh, particularly for environmental uh, applications. But more recently, we've got into um, looking at resource recovery in an attempt to try to approach this circular uh, economy idea, which is that we were able to extract particular resources out of waste and cycle them back into production. And I'll touch on that near the end of my talk. So first, uh, what is the Delano Lab? Well, we are a motley crew of uh, undergraduate, masters, PhD, and, and postdocs. Uh, this is the group before I left for France back at the end of August. Uh, and uh, as far as I can tell, they're still blossoming, or maybe because of my absence or despite it, I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> and some of the topics that we touch on in my lab include environmental electrochemistry, so developing reactive nanosorbents or active uh, sorbents. Uh, we look towards contaminant degradation of wastewater, uh, resource recovery. We also work a lot on membrane technologies. So in particular, we develop electrochemical membranes a class of membranes which I helped invent, which is combining electrochemical processes with separation processes. And we, we will talk a lot about that today. Uh, we work a lot uh, in collaboration with First Nations uh, communities, uh, primarily in Ontario. We've worked with uh, a community called Aquasasne, which is on the border with New York, uh, started early collaborations with Oneida, and we work heavily with uh, the Six Nations of the Grand River. And we try to co-develop research projects with them, identify what are their environmental needs, develop um, uh, in some cases, remediation technologies or sensing technologies, uh, as well as uh, low impact wastewater system design. And uh, we're leading some education and training uh, programs with some, starting with, med, uh, starting with some First Nations uh, students. And because of the pandemic, since my lab heavily relies on uh, or develops separations technologies. Uh, aerosols are just another thing to separate. So we've developed a series of, of aerosol uh, measurement techniques and separation technologies, uh, focusing now on electrospun fibers, uh, catalytic electrospun fibers, um, and various polymer nanocomposites. But I won't touch on that in this talk today. But if you're interested, I can get into more detail in the question and answer period. Uh, so some of the motivation for developing advanced separations is that over the past 500 years, we can see this tremendous growth in urbanization. So we see some of the large countries in the world that we are very familiar with, Japan, United States, China, have not just increased their populations over the past 500 years, 
but heavily urbanized. That means more and more people are moving from agrarian societies, uh, that means farms, towards cities. And if you look at uh, a map of the global populations that are expected to be living in urban areas around the world, these actually match with some of the countries that have most rapidly urbanized. You see some uh, obvious ones like China and India, where in China, it's expected that by 2050, almost a billion or over a billion people will be in urban settings. But you also have uh, large countries like United States, um, Brazil, and maybe uh, a lot of people forget Nigeria, a huge country um, in Africa that is rapidly urbanizing. So why is urbanization a problem? Well, if you overlay urbanization with uh, water stress, you see that in most cases, those countries that are urbanizing most rapidly are also, they ha also happen to be the most water stressed. The few exceptions actually are Nigeria and Brazil, but apart from that, India, China, United States, Mexico, uh, and many countries, and South Africa, and many countries in Europe are becoming increasingly water stressed uh, as they urbanize. So what does that mean? It means that if you have very little water, but you also have very dense populations, uh, what's going to happen is that you're probably going to have to reuse the water that you're that you're uh, wasting. And so since urbanization is concentrating more people around fewer water sources, uh, and that means that water needs are going to be increasing, we are going to more and more frequently have to recycle our water. This has already started to happen in places like Israel and uh, Singapore, where they, and in California, where they take wastewater, they treat it, and they put it back into uh, the distribution system to be treated and, and put back in our tap. So despite some of the squeamishness around that, uh, we hope to allay a lot of those fears by developing better and better technologies. But of course, uh, you can imagine that the technology that were developed for treating surface waters are different than those that are used to treat wastewaters. They have different uh, targets, different um, uh, treatment uh, targets, and, they're, and also we're looking at different concentrations of contaminants. So when you now start thinking about taking a wastewater and putting it back into drinking water, one of the issues is that uh, the types of contaminants are different. So we typically think of agricultural or municipal contaminants entering waters, including nitrates and phosphates, pesticides, herbicides, viruses, and bacteria. But we increasingly think about other types of contaminants, including industrial contaminants now that might enter wastewaters, either leaching through unlined uh, tailing ponds or being dumped directly into uh, wastewaters. And uh, if you also think about the increasing uh, focus on mining as we move towards an electrified economy. That means an economy that relies primarily on alternative uh, uh, energy sources, as well as electrified vehicles. Mining will increasingly become an important consideration, which means that mining wastes become increasingly uh, uh, serious and, and widespread. And so contamination from mining becomes a, a, a real consideration. So now if we're looking at wastewaters cycled back and drinking waters, we have to consider many different types of pollutants at different concentrations that might be expected in typical sources for drinking water. Now, membranes are uh, a well-established, a fairly mature technology, and uh, membranes have been used in all sorts of separations from wastewater to petrochemical separations to bioprocessing. And they primarily rely on uh, one of three uh, separation mechanisms. So they either rely on separating solutes based on size, based on their charge, and some of them based on solubility, especially in the case of reverse osmosis in which you're separating salts from water. Uh, most membranes actually rely on size exclusion for in the, in the drinking water and wastewater treatment fields. Now, uh, while membranes are very mature and, and uh, have been already applied to various industries and have shown uh, great success, membranes do suffer from a few key limitations. Uh, I'm just going to list three major limitations that, that I see. One is that smaller contaminants require more energy to remove. So as you get to smaller and smaller molecules that you want to separate from your water or your wastewater, you need to create a membrane that is tighter and tighter. That means a decrease in the overall pore size of the membrane until eventually you create a membrane that has no well-defined pores. They're simply a dense polymer that uh, operates based on, on, on differences in diffusion rates. So you can see that as you go from colloids to bacteria to viruses and eventually to small organic molecules, you go from a lower energy system to a high energy system. 
And so if we start considering the removal of more and more organic contaminants, for example, uh, we are going to have to rely more heavily on higher energy separation mechanisms or higher energy membranes. So that's one uh, main challenge, both in terms of the, uh, the, the practical feasibility of switching all the low energy membranes to high energy membranes, but also some of the major technical challenges that arise when you deal with these uh, high energy requirement uh, membranes. Uh, another major limitation with membranes is that membranes don't treat or transform contaminants. Rather, they simply concentrate contaminants in what's called a retentate stream and then transport those contaminants somewhere else. Very often, those are transported to landfills, sometimes incinerated, actually very often incinerated. Um, and so you can imagine that this uh, is a problem. So sometimes you'll have some contaminants that pass through your membrane into your permeate, especially if they're small organics and they're difficult to separate. Otherwise, if they're concentrated, uh, they're going to be disposed of somewhere else. So this lack of direct treatment or degradation of contaminants is a real concern. And finally, this has been a longstanding issue with membranes is that over their usage, uh, membranes eventually foul. And fouling can come in many different forms, biofouling, organic fouling, colloidal fouling, and mineral scaling. And what fouling does is it blocks essentially the, the pores of the membranes if you're dealing with a porous membrane or it alters, it shifts the diffusion mechanisms on the surface of the membrane. Uh, and, and in that way, it changes the, the way that you're, or the effectiveness of your separation. And so there's been about you know, 30 years worth of research focused on how to combat fouling. I'm not gonna get into fouling in this talk. I have in previous talks, uh, and my lab has spent a lot of time developing anti-fouling uh, services, uh, but here I'll just touch on it very briefly. So we have these three major limitations, this idea that Smaller molecules are more difficult to remove, and therefore we need more specialized membranes with, which require higher energy. We have membranes that are simply passive barriers to solutes. They don't treat contaminants. And we have membranes that foul, so these three uh, major limitations. And in this talk, I hope to convince you that electrochemical membranes, while marginally more expensive to produce, are able to simultaneously tackle many of these challenges. So how do electrochemical membranes uh, tackle these challenges? First of all, some nomenclature. In the literature, uh, people call these electrochemical membranes ECMs. They, conduct, they, they can call them electroconductive membranes or conductive membranes or electrified membranes or electrically responsive membranes. All these are essentially the same idea. It's that you have a membrane which is not a, simply a passive barrier, but uh, based on size exclusion or based on diffusive properties but rather one in which you can apply a electric potential to the surface and in that way, engage the membrane in a second type of separation, either based on charge, based on redox potentials, uh, based on uh, other types of electrically generated electrochemical um, separation mechanisms. And it's been shown by my group and by several others that using electrochemical membrane and ECM, you can actually prevent uh, or limit uh, certain types of fouling. With bacterial uh, fouling in this image, for example, it's because you can actually oxidize bacteria on the surface of the membranes by uh, direct uh, oxidation of the membranes, of, of the bacteria. Uh, we've also shown that electrochemical membranes can directly degrade contaminants. So they can engage in in situ redox reactions with contaminants and either transform these contaminants or entirely mineralize them. And uh, we've recently shown that now that you have an electrochemical surface integrated into your membrane, uh, you can actually start to use these membranes, not just to prevent fouling or to degrade contaminants, but actually to engage in sensing. So you can create a small sensor based on, your, on, on the surface of your conductive membrane. And in that way, potentially detect the onset of fouling, or even we hope, to differentiate between different types of pollutants or phalanx that might come in contact with the membrane. So now integrating sensing with separation is a really exciting uh, new cutting edge field. In this talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on contaminant degradation and some of our early work in this area and some of the future uh, experiments we hope to achieve. So there are many contaminants in the environment. Uh, <clears throat> there are model contaminants that we use in our lab and there are realistic contaminants that we uh, have started to and hope to continue using. Uh, I'll start by talking primarily about some of these model contaminants. So azo dyes, such as methyl orange, are one of these model contaminants. 
And the reason they're model contaminants is because they're very easy to uh, use in the lab. When you uh, put methyl orange in, in, in aqueous solutions, they uh, are quite bright and orange. And if you break this azide bond, this double nitrogen bond, they lose their color. So very quickly, you can see the degradation, the, the breaking apart of this molecule. And by breaking this azide bond, you actually make them more susceptible to uh, natural process of degradation through bacterial degradation. So actually breaking the azide bond does eventually lead to a more uh, degradable byproduct. So we're gonna focus in this talk on some of these model contaminants. In fact, these dyes are used in industry primarily in places like Turkey and Bangladesh and Portugal, where they produce lots of dyes for textiles. Uh, in North America, they're not often found in high concentrations in, in wastewaters. So they are relevant in certain, uh, in certain sectors, uh, but they're very useful for identifying how effective your treatment technology could be. So before we get into the actual separations, a little uh, background on how electrochemical membranes work. Uh, so electrochemical membranes are simply a porous material, a membrane that has either in its pores, ideally, or on its surface, a electrochemical or electrocatalytically active uh, thin film. And then you apply a potential to that surface. And in that, in that way, you can either turn your membranes into a cathode or into an anode, or both if you're able to switch back and forth between your applied potential. So if you make your membrane a cathode, you can actually change the surface of your membrane to be highly negatively charged. Uh, this can repel negative charges. It can also generate peroxides in, in, uh, in, in liquid water. Uh, you can create oxygen or hydrogen bubbles rather, and you can induce very high pHs locally at the surface of the membrane, which is actually an exciting uh, opportunity. If instead you change the polarity and you apply a positive potential to your uh, membrane, you can create membranes that are anodic, which have uh, positive uh, surface charges. They therefore repel positive charges. They can generate hydroxyl radicals. They can create oxygen bubbles that emanate from the surface of the membrane. And in contrast, they can induce extreme low pHs at the surface of your membrane. Uh, and in this way, you can actually engage in some interesting separations or even reactions. So you have this now additional uh, lever with a membrane not just its size, not just the size of its pores, but now the, um, the magnitude of, of the potential that you apply, the polarity of that potential, and in some cases, the frequency uh, of the potential alternating back and forth between positive and negative um, uh, applied potential. So this is a really exciting uh, additional functionality that you can give to a whole range of separations. So how might you actually make such a membrane? Well, that's uh, one of the major challenges that my lab uh, tries to overcome. You can start with a polymeric support. You can add conductive materials to it and, and then try to bind that conductive material to that surface in ways that will make it robust and uh, useful for industry. Some of the materials we use include uh, conductive polymers, nanomaterials, and metals. Uh, much of the field uh, has been concentrated around these three types of materials for uh, reasonable for, for a good reason, because they are conductive generally and can allow the flow of, of electrons. Uh, we have found that uh, conductive polymers are not the most ideal system to work with. So we focus primarily on nanomaterials, primarily carbon nanotubes and reduced graphene oxides, as well as metals and thin films of metals um, and bimetals. So some of the nanomaterials we use include, like I mentioned, carbon nanotubes, as well as carbon nanotube composites uh, with different uh, nanomaterial nan nanoparticles. We've also used graphene and reduced graphene oxide and uh, graphene oxide. Uh, and we've uh, played around a little bit with um, cellulose nanocrystals uh, that have been coated in a thin film shell of iron uh, to try to create um, uh, sort of more sustainable types of materials for our membranes. So this is a range of different types of materials that we've used. And because this is the uh, Brockhaus Institute for Materials Research, I'm primarily going to be focusing on the materials and materials characterization. So one, uh, if you're looking at degradation of, of contaminants, one compound that's been around for a long time is iron. Uh, for about 50 years, maybe 75 years, people have known that iron filings, so shavings of iron, uh, can engage in redox reactions and actually can uh, 
degrade contaminants in situ. Uh, in the past 20 years or so, uh, from iron filings, we've come down to iron nanoparticles and specifically nano zero valent iron or NZVI, which are uh, zero valencies of iron that have very high redox potentials because uh, this very small nanoparticle size can quickly engage in a whole series of reactions with uh, contaminants. They've been shown to be very effective in dechlorinating uh, TCE and PCBs, which are chlorinated contaminants in the environment. They've also been shown to uh, react with inorganic ions, anions, and even uh, have some reactions with radionuclides. So they're very attractive because they have high reduction potential, very fast reaction kinetics. Uh, they're inexpensive and easily manufactured. And the byproduct of, of this NZVI is just rust. So uh, people think that it's actually not, not a bad thing to leave this in the environment after it's finished with its uh, redox reactions. One of the major problems, however, is that NZVI rapidly aggregates. And as it aggregates, it forms these large colloids. And that has a few problems. One is that since it, read, since it readily forms these colloids, it reduces its overall available surface area. Therefore, there's lower surface area available for reaction. Larger colloids also make it more difficult to move through, for example, contaminated soils, or even to have them well dispersed in uh, water or wastewater treatment plants because they readily precipitate. And this low mobility, therefore, decreases its availability to uh, contaminants. Uh, and as we, as uh, these contaminants, uh, sorry, as these NZVI particles grow, uh, they overall uh, lose the nano-ness, that very high uh, uh, reactivity that they uh, once had. So our idea was instead to try to grow and bind NZVI nanoparticles, very well-defined nanoparticles, on the surface of carbon nanotubes, and then make catalytic membranes or electrocatalytic membranes that contained carbon nanotubes and iron. Why? Well, the first idea is that if you bind iron nanoparticles to the carbon nanotubes, you can immobilize these iron nanoparticles, preventing them from aggregating. Further, if you bind them to CNTs, carbon nanotubes, which have very high amounts of delocalized electrons, potentially the high concentration of delocalized electrons on the carbon nanotubes could continue to reduce, chemically reduce the NZVI uh, from their oxides back to their uh, zero valence state for continued usage. They don't, uh, they're not expended too quickly. And if you create a catalytic membrane uh, on the surface of a membrane, then you're able to pass contaminants through your membrane continuously uh, in, a, in a much more uh, engineeringly efficient manner. So what we did is we first synthesized these uh, carbon nanotubes. You can see here carbon nanotubes with, oops, sorry, carbon nanotubes with iron nanoparticles grown on their surface. Here in this uh, TEM image on the, on the right, you see controlled carbon nanotubes, which are just entirely made of carbon, and our NZVI CNTs, which have these uh, clusters of green, which are the indications of iron grown on the, uh, on the carbon nanotubes. Then we deposit these carbon nanotubes onto the surface of our conventional porous membranes. We cross-link them with a few different polymers and we create a membrane that has a conductive and, uh, and, and catalytic surface. And then we want to test the ability of these membranes to now degrade a contaminant. So we're going to use that model contaminant, that orange dye, the uh, azo dye, methyl orange, first in batch and then in flow through reactions. And what we see, sure enough, is that in batch reactions, when you have an orange dye, and you have a catalytic carbon nanotube iron uh, membrane, you're able to remove uh, the, the, the concentration of the dye, you're able to break that azide bond uh, under applied potentials. Now in flow through systems, so here we're flowing the methyl orange through the membrane. Uh, we did a, a series of control experiments to see the difference between the absorption reaction, so the, or the absorption of uh, methyl orange to this carbon nanotubes, and the actual degradation of that carbon nanotube. So we want to make sure it's not just a fancy sorbent, but rather it's actually engaging in electrochemical degradations. So with a membrane made of pure carbon nanotubes, no iron, and no applied potential, what we see is sure enough, there is some absorption of the methyl orange. So here on the uh, y-axis, you see the concentration of methyl orange. That's slowly decreasing over time on the x-axis uh, and decreasing to some degree the amount of methyl orange in the system. Now, when we have a carbon nanotube with iron nanoparticles grown on it, 
we see statistically insignificant differences between that and the other control. So again, no applied potential. All we have is absorption of methyl orange to the surface of the membrane. And you can see eventually it seems to at longer times at about 180 minutes or 30 or three hours, we see it seems to start to plateau the absorption sites of the CNTs become saturated with methyl orange. <clears throat> now, when we apply a positive, a, a, a negative potential rather to the carbon nanotubes, we see the statistically significant decrease in the concentration of methyl orange because of this applied potential. We now have uh, an electrochemical degradation of the iron nanoparticle uh, of the of the methyl orange, and we do the same thing, but now with carbon nanotubes and iron nanoclusters grown on their surface, we see an even greater rapid decrease in the methyl orange concentration. And this indicates to us that not only are we uh, removing and degrading the uh, methyl orange through an electrochemical reaction, but actually the applied potential, the applied current to the electrochemical membrane is likely regenerating the reactivity of the iron. Because if you compare it to the iron CNTs, uh, with no, uh, no applied potential, the iron is still catalytic. It's still engaging in those redox reactions. It still should be catalyzing the degradation of the methyl orange. But now when we have the electrocatalyst, we see an enhanced, a significantly enhanced degradation over the other control systems. So we believe this is a, a really nice example of how a, a flow through porous membrane can become an electrocatalytic material to uh, continuously regenerate these inexpensive iron catalysts, and to uh, uh, therefore de continually degrade contaminants. So I find this a, a really exciting um, development in the membrane field. And we have a bunch of other ideas of how to move from iron, which is a pretty decent uh, reactive center, to even more reactive uh, metals and bimetals that have uh, specifically targeted um, catalytic properties towards other more aggressive contaminants, such as fluorinated and chlorinated contaminants. Now, actually with uh, Professor Latulip, um, we did a review and a meta-analysis of the literature of all the research papers that have come out in the past, uh, in the past 10 years or so, in the past 15 years, uh, in this electrochemically active or electrochemical membrane field. And what we found is that uh, those membranes that were made of conductive polymer coatings or made of graphitic nanomaterial coatings seem to have this upper boundary, this trade-off, what's often called a, a Robeson trade-off. That is, as you increase your conductivity, you decrease the membrane permeability. So you see here on the y-axis conductivity. So if you're getting more and more conductive, higher and higher up on the y-axis, you seem to decrease your overall permeability. And the reason we hypothesize for this is that to increase your overall conductivity using conductive polymers or graphitic nanomaterials, you generally have to add more of this material onto the surface of your membrane. And when you add more of this material onto the surface of your membrane, you occlude more of the pores and therefore decrease the overall permeability. However, we did not see the same kind of trade-off with respect to membranes made from metal thin films. And so this motivated us to start looking into developing membranes that had thin films of metals uh, because we might not have the same kind of a loss in permeability that you observe for other systems. So in the next phase of research, we started pivoting towards uh, the development of uh, metallic membranes. And this is much more challenging. Uh, you can imagine that if you wanted to create a very thin metal film on the surface, you could turn towards uh, sputter coating but that has to be done under vacuum and is probably not scalable for large scale membranes. You can turn towards ALD or atomic layer deposition. Again, uh, good for microelectronics, but maybe not great for hundreds of square meters or even tens of thousands of square meters of membranes for large scale treatment. So we've turned towards solution phase growth of metals, uh, electrolysis plating essentially, as an, as an alternative mode of trying to grow uh, metals Onto our, onto our membranes. And the first step was simply to try to grow bimetallic catalysts inside the pores of our membranes, and then eventually try to make continuous or contiguous films of metals so that the whole membrane could become electrocatalytic and not just catalytic. So in this example, uh, the next story I'm gonna tell, uh, we are flowing, um, we, are, we are growing 
bimetals, bimetallic catalysts inside the pores of membranes so that the entire pore structure of the membranes becomes catalytically active. This is one of the great advantages, I think, of using a membrane as a flow through catalyst material is that not only can you do separations, selective separations on the surface of the membrane, but you can also take advantage of this very high internal surface area of the membrane to engage in high surface area reactions. So we approached this in, uh, with, a, with a, a relatively inexpensive nickel copper bimetallic catalyst. A lot of people have looked at palladium or platinum. These are very expensive metals. And again, probably not scalable to the large volumes of water that we need, would need to be treated. We look towards nickel copper, uh, both because they are uh, uh, widely abundant, much, much cheaper, about three orders of magnitude cheaper than palladium or platinum. Uh, and if you look at the elemental table of uh, rare elements or the elemental table of, um, what do they call it? Uh, endangered elements, nickel and copper are nowhere near to be endangered, which is good, uh, which means that you can actually use large quantities of these for, uh, for membranes and not fear some kind of price uh, um, spike if you're starting to deplete one of these uh, resources. <clears throat> so we take our membrane and we want to grow uh, nickel copper bimetallic catalysts inside the pores. But one of the challenges is how do you make this nickel copper nano catalyst bind to the inside of the pore? That's quite difficult. So what we do is we flush the membrane with uh, dopamine and then induce a, a polymerization of the dopamine inside the pores just sufficiently enough to coat the pores and not so much to not so much that we block the inside of the pores. And then we flow a uh, metallic salt, either in this case, nickel sulfate or copper sulfate or both through the uh, pores. And the nickel salts and the copper salts bind to the uh, polydopamine. And then we reduce these nickel and, copper, nickel and copper sulfate salts with sodium borohydride to produce these nickel and copper nanoparticles. We've done this in two ways. The first way that I showed you is called the co-reduction of nickel and copper. So we flow uh, both nickel and copper sulfate together through this polydopamine coated membrane. And the second way is to uh, pass one after the other. So first you pass through nickel sulfate, then reduce it into a nickel nanoparticle. And then you pass over copper sulfate uh, and reduce it into a copper nanoparticle. And we want to examine the differences in how these nanoparticles grow, the differences in their reactivities, and the differences in their ability to degrade a model contaminant. So we call this second mode uh, the replacement reaction because we have uh, first nickel, nickel replaced by copper. And then once you have these, <clears throat> these uh, catalytically uh, uh, enhanced membranes, we're going to use a, <clears throat> a model contaminant, another one in this case, 4-nitrophenol, which is widely found in wastewater treatment plants and is a significant contaminant. Uh, and a contaminant of concern, a phenolic contaminant of concern. We flow this nitrophenol through these catalytic membranes. We add a small amount of borohydride and we try to observe the degradation, the transformation of this full nitrophenol into a different compound, specifically for aminophenol. We do this both in flow through and in batch modes and observe the differences. I won't get too much into the engineering differences uh, and again, focus on the materials. So, during the synthesis, or after the synthesis rather, we looked at surface and cross-sectional distributions of the nanoparticles. And what we see is that in the control case, we just have nickel, in the replacement reaction and the co-reduction reaction, remember the replacement is nickel followed by copper. And in the co-reduction, we have the nickel and the copper flowing together. In all cases, we see broad distribution of both nickel and copper on the surface of the membrane. And nicely, nickel and copper nanoparticles distributed through the entire depth or thickness of the membrane, suggesting that there are nickel and copper metals distributed throughout the pores. We want to confirm if these were actually nanoparticles or not, uh, a difficult thing to do. So we dissolved these produced membranes in a strong solvent, dissolved away the polymer, and then dispersed these, what was left, these, uh, these hopefully nanoparticles onto TEM grids and analyzed for TEM. And what we see is that, uh, sure enough, we have nanoparticles uh, of copper and nickel. So in the control, we see nickel nanoparticles that have an average size of around 53 nanometers. In the replacement reaction, so where we flow nickel, then copper, what we see is very interesting. We have uh, nickel nanoparticles that are about 20 nanometers, 
and then much smaller uh, four nanometer copper nanoparticles grown on the surface of these nickel nanoparticles. It's a bit hard to see here. Um, I've tried to highlight some of the copper nanoparticles with pink dots. If you look at the image, it's very, if you look at the image much more closely, it's very evident. Uh, it's difficult to show in PowerPoint sometimes. Uh, but interestingly enough, when you look at diffraction patterns in TEM, you see very clear crystalline peaks for uh, both the, uh, sorry, just for the, um, <clears throat> for the copper. So the copper forms this clear crystalline phase uh, in TEM. And in the co-reduction, where you send the nickel and copper together, one might expect this, when you send the two metals together and then reduce them simultaneously, we don't see distinct nanoparticles between nickel and copper. They seem to be melded into this kind of uh, 20 nanometer composite. So we think that the actual the copper is doping into the nickel nanoparticle. And why is this interesting? Well, uh, first of all, oh, right. And this is a, this is a, uh, a zoom in of one of the nickel copper, nickel copper alloys in the replacement reaction. So we see this very clear um, crystal, crystal pattern. So why is it interesting? Well, it seems as though the nickel nanoparticles are smaller when copper is around than when they're there by themselves. They move from about 50 nanometers down to about 20 nanometers. So the copper actually inhibits the growth of nickel nanoparticles, we think. And this inhibition is probably beneficial because now we have smaller nanoparticles with higher uh, relative surface area per volume and therefore potentially higher reactivity. Further in the co-reduction step, we see it seems that the copper is doping into the nickel and this might give some interesting properties we'll see shortly. We also did XPS analysis and um, without going to too much detail, what we see is that metallic nickel is actually not observed, but we do see, uh, oops, we do see uh, metallic copper uh, in some cases. And uh, instead we see nickel hydroxide uh, formed rather than a, a metallic nickel. So even though we're reducing both the nickel and the copper with sodium borohydride, uh, when the copper forms metallic clusters, the nickel doesn't seem to be turning into a, a metallic state. Um, and this has implications for its reactivity. Now we go on to actually trying to assess these membranes for their uh, reactivity when we flow uh, four nitrophenol in their presence. So in figure A, what we're looking at is batch mode. We simply soak the membrane, this catalytic membrane in four nitrophenol. And what we see is that we get very fast reaction rates uh, in the first five minutes and those reaction rates decrease uh, over the course of 60 minutes. So it seems like these bimetallic catalysts are becoming expended and losing their overall reactivity. When we flow membranes, oh, sorry, when we flow the 4 nitrophenol through the membrane, now the, the contaminants are not just engaging with the surface of the membrane, but are actually now passing through all the internal porous structure. And we see much, much higher reaction rate constants. So about four, orders, four or five orders of magnitude greater uh, reaction rate constants over the batch reaction. So really, we're taking advantage of this high internal surface area of the membranes to provide very high uh, surface area for reactivity. And interestingly, the co-reduced nickel copper, that means the one that didn't have a distinct crystal phase, didn't have distinct nanoparticles between copper and nickel, uh, the one that was formed when copper and nickel were, were reduced together, that is the one that has the highest reactivity and the highest reaction rates. What's interesting about that is that uh, likely this doping of the copper in the nickel nanoparticle changes the electronic state, changes the electronic structure, and enhances somehow its, react its, its reactivity towards these organic molecules. And we actually find that the co-reduced nickel copper has both three times greater specific surface area by BET analysis than the uh, replacement reaction. So it both has a uh, much higher surface area, a different uh, structure itself, uh, and, there, and those two things combined, we think, provide this much higher reactivity. So this is uh, some really interesting results, we think, and, and leads us to both demonstrate that bimetallic catalysts are much more active than their individual metals, um, and that this nicely blended doping of metals provides uh, enhanced reactivity and maybe as a, a platform for uh, studying other types of doped bimetals. Uh, and then we, we think that the way that the 4-nitrophenol is turning into 4 aminophenol is by production of hydrides. Unfortunately, we haven't yet quantified uh, how much hydride is produced, uh, but based on some literature uh, search and some um, 
some chemical analyses, some other chemical analyses, we, we suspect that hydrogides are being produced and are engaging in this reaction at the, um, at the uh, nitrile group to produce this uh, four amino phenol. Uh, so this is uh, some, some really interesting preliminary work. This paper is not yet uh, published, it's under review and hopefully will be published soon. So you guys are some of the first audiences to see uh, this work, which I think is, is great. I think BIMR is a great form for uh, sharing these kinds of results. Some of the things we don't know, however, are what are the distribution of catalysts inside the pores uh, on the carbon nanotubes in the case of the iron uh, CNT structures, both during and after use? Do the catalysts move or uh, change the location during uh, flow of liquids through the membranes? How stable are these catalysts? We've done some stability tests. We don't see any leaching, uh, but we've only done leaching for a few days. We haven't done long-term tests yet. Uh, and we also don't know if the distribution of catalysts uh, preferentially moves towards dead end pores as opposed to through pores. So we, we flow our uh, metal salts through the, through the pore structure, but we don't know if the metal salts um, preferentially uh, trap, get trapped inside dead end pores instead of through pores. Uh, which would be problematic for their optimal usage. Something else we don't know um, are the actual pore structures of these membranes themselves. So how do the catalysts catalyst change the pore structure? How does the dopamine change the pore structure? Can we get some sort of 3D morphology for these pore structures, which is what I hope to do actually here in France with some uh, 3D x-ray tomography. Uh, and finally, we have studied, we begin to study the oxidation states um, uh, before use through XPS. Uh, we haven't completed the studies looking at the oxidation states after use or how the oxidation states might change throughout the membrane um, as, the, as the nanoparticles are being uh, used or regenerated. So these are still open questions, which we hope to pursue. And if there are people out there that want to collaborate on this, that have expertise in this, my lab is always open to uh, help and uh, collaborations. Okay, in the last... Uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to talk about uh, one other uh, major initiative that my lab has been pioneering, which is the development of nanosorbents for resource recovery. Uh, the motivation here is that there are many heavy metals in tailings and industrial wastewaters, including toxic metals such as mercury or arsenic, as well as precious metals such as gold and platinum and palladium, those very expensive metals that uh, we didn't want to use for our catalysts. <clears throat> and uh, especially as you consider our transition to the electrified economy, we're going to be using more and more of these precious metals, uh, which means that uh, we're going to be expanding our mining operations around the world. Uh, and we're going to have to uh, look towards electronic recycling. So there's already a few companies out there like Lifecycle, uh, based in, in Toronto or Kingston, which are looking at electronic uh, waste uh, uh, dissolution and resource recovery from these electronics, because the electronics actually contain already very high concentrations of precious metals like cobalt, gold, uh, and of course, lithium for batteries. So these wastewaters, uh, both industrial and uh, mining uh, wastewaters, can contain quite high concentrations of uh, valuable met uh, metals. Conventionally, the way that you would separate uh, metal ions from wastewaters is either through alkaline precipitation, conventional coagulation and flocculation, but this requires high chemical consumption and has some handling and disposable, uh, disposal requirements, which are complicated. Uh, people have often developed adsorption columns uh, and ion exchange columns. This has very low chemical consumption initially, but to regenerate those adsorption uh, systems or to regenerate those ion columns, you need uh, strong acids, um, which creates a secondary pollution problem. And uh, people have also looked towards membrane filtration. However, membranes foul in scale, especially when you're trying to separate uh, small quantities of highly scaling minerals, uh, as well as using these in real wastewaters, which contain high concentrations of calcium. And therefore, the membranes fail very frequently, uh, and you need to use anti-scalance and anti-foulance, which cause, again, a secondary pollution problem. It's been known uh, for a while that carbon nanotubes are very good absorbents. Uh, they're very effective because they have very high surface area. They're highly functionalizable. Um, they have high electrical conductivity, which is an interesting uh, property for carbon nanotubes. Uh, however, based, uh, even though they are very good uh, sorbents, uh, 
they have very high cost and therefore some environment and also some environmental concerns. So there's a strong incentive to use CNTs because they're very effective and actually more effective because of their high surface area over conventional sorbents, but to use them in a closed loop regenerative process. So if you think about using sorbents, you would add your sorbent, in this case, carbon nanotubes to your system. You would absorb the metal to the carbon nanotubes, and then you would have to regenerate the carbon nanotubes for continued use. This is often done in the literature by adding strong acids, concentrated nitric acid. So you would add concentrated nitric acid to remove the metals from your sorbent so you can continue to reuse them. This is not environmentally friendly um, and can actually also cause the degradation of carbon nanotubes, can, can eventually over time oxidize the surface of the carbon nanotubes and make them less effective overall. Uh, a small aside, which is that different metals have different redox potentials, uh, which is well known. Gold, for example, has a very high redox potential, which means that it's easier to be reduced on an adsorbent. Uh, in comparison, lithium has a very low reduction potential, negative in this case, and is much, much easier to be oxidized, which is actually why we use them in lithium ion batteries, because they want to let go of their electrons very rap rapidly, and so they're very good at uh, powering devices. Um, theoretically, the greater the difference between reduction potential, the more selectivity you could have in electrochemical systems. So if you can use, for example, in this case, carbon nanotubes in an electrochemical separation process, you could actually tune the separation potentially by applying different electric potentials to the surface of your material. And uh, if you're considering gold, as this one example I'll talk about is, gold is usually present in acidic wastewaters either from um, e-waste leaching or in the mining industry. So uh, wastewaters that have pHs around one or two. Gold is known to be inert at neutral conditions, but actually surprisingly we found that, uh, and the literature supports this, that gold can be oxidized under certain conditions. So what is, our, what is our novel idea? Our novel idea is you have these metal ions in, in solution, you add the carbon nanotubes, but now what you do instead is you create a temporary electrode. So you filter these carbon nanotubes that have been saturated with the, ion, uh, with, with the, with the metal ions through a conventional membrane. This creates a temporary electrode. You apply an electric potential to this membrane and you release the ions, you regenerate the carbon nanotubes with an applied electric potential instead of an, an applied acid um, like nitric acid, or in the case of gold, what you'd have to do would be apply aqua regia, which is very uh, expensive and very difficult to, to work with because it's so aggressive. So uh, this has a few different steps. The first thing is the absorption. We studied the absorption of gold on a few different types of carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes that had no functionalization, carbon nanotubes that were carboxylated and those that were aminated. And we looked at the absorption of gold from an acidic gold chloride solution, which is representative of what you might find in an, in an electronic waste. And interestingly, what we find is that uh, the pristine carbon nanotubes have the highest amount of absorption for gold. Uh, we actually thought that the amine functionalized CNTs would have the highest absorption because we had expected that the negatively charged gold chloride would be attracted to the uh, amine functional, positive amine functional centers. Uh, but actually the pristine CNTs seem to have higher absorption. When we did zeta potential, confirmed that our um, amine functionalized CNTs did in fact have much higher zeta potential. So even though they seem to be uh, slightly better dispersed and had higher positive potentials, uh, the amine functionalized CNTs were not the best at absorbing gold. When we did BET analysis, we found that actually the specific surface area of the pristine carbon nanotubes was higher than that of the amine functionalized carbon nanotubes. And we, so we suspect that this tremendous difference in absorption uh, counterbalanced the, sorry, uh, tremendous difference in specific surface area counterbalanced the positive, the positive zeta potential of the amine functionalized carbon nanotubes, um, as well as their slightly higher uh, dispersion. So this is sort of an interesting uh, discovery. Uh, we did some absorption experiments. Here, there's probably too much data to look at, but uh, quickly we, we did absorption curves, which um, were a bit messy sometimes. There's very fast uh, kinetics of absorption. We tried mapping these to both uh, Freundlich and Langmuir isotherms, and actually the best isotherm to match is one I don't show here, unfortunately, which is the redlich peterson absorption curve um, and, or model. Uh, but it follows fairly standard absorption kinetics and absorption 
um, uh, uh, curves. And then when we do XPS analysis, what we find I think is very interesting, which is that pristine carbon nanotubes, that's the black line, the pristine carbon nanotubes have a large amount of gold three plus from the gold chloride adsorbed onto their surface. But the amine functionalized and the carboxyl functionalized have almost no perceptible amount of gold three plus. All the gold has been reduced in this case to gold zero. Uh, so clearly the carbon nanotubes are shutting the electrons to the gold, reducing them to their, sorry, sorry, oxidizing them to their, sorry, reducing them to their, to their gold zero state. And this, uh, this uh, reduced state is much more prevalent in the amine functionalized carbon nanotubes than it is in our pristine uh, or in our, in our carboxyl case. So what this implies is that for pristine carbon nanotubes, we have probably a combination of chemisorption and physisorption, but for our functionalized CNTs, it's dominated by chemisorption. We have this very clear shift uh, of gold three plus to gold zero. And we ascribe this again to the delocalized electrons on CNTs, which are expected to reduce the gold to gold zero. So now we have an interesting problem on our hands. We have gold zero on our CNTs and gold zero is the one that's, um, right? Gold wants to, uh, pref prefers to hold on to its electrons, prefers to stay in its zero state. And conventionally what you would need to do is add like operegia to redissolve the gold zero. So, um, oh yeah, and, and before I get into that, for the temporary electrode, what we found actually was that the amine functionalized CNTs produced the best membranes, so we stuck with those. So they produced high enough adsorption uh, as compared to the pristine. So they weren't as good as pristine, but they were good enough. But they produced much more uh, conductive, much more uniform membranes than the pristine carbon nanotubes. Okay, so now we, we need to try to get the gold off of these uh, temporary electrodes, off of these carbon nanotubes. We want to regenerate the carbon nanotubes. But the gold has turned into gold zero on uh, the surface of the um, amine functionalized CNTs. You can oxidize the gold using aqua regia, which is a combination of nitric and hydrochloric acid. And what literature suggests is that uh, gold first is oxidized by the nitrate and then, sorry, by, by the chloride and then solubilized, no, how does it go? Oh yeah, first <laughs> oxidized by the nitrate and then solubilized by the chlorine. So people in the literature suspect that what happens is the nitrite attacks the gold, uh, changing its oxidation state, but it still remains fairly stable. And the chloride is able to uh, solubilize the gold into solution by forming gold chloride. So we hypothesized that if we did the same reaction in uh, an acidic sodium chloride system, we might be able to use an applied potential to replace the nitric acid. So try to oxidize the gold with an applied electric field instead of uh, an electric current, instead of using nitric acid. And sure enough, that's what happened. When we increase the applied current from zero to 13 milliamps, we see this increase in desorption of the mass of gold from our CNTs. So on the blue axis, on the, on the left uh, y-axis, we see the total mass of gold that's desorbed from the CNTs. And on the red, the equivalent desorption percentage of that gold from the CNTs. So uh, granted, it's not 100% desorption, but what we are able to do here is still desorb gold in sodium chloride, acidic sodium chloride, uh, without the application of uh, nitric acid, just with the application of an applied potential. And we studied what would happen if you change the total amount of gold that was absorbed on the uh, on the CNTs in the first place. And what we see, unfortunately, is diminishing returns. So we are able to, in the blue graph here, we are able to uh, desorb more and more gold uh, if there's more gold on the CNTs to begin with. But as a percentage of total desorption, we um, go, we, we're stuck around this 30% for high concentrations of gold. If you use, if you have a carbon nanotube that only absorbs a small amount of gold, we actually are able to get up to about 65 or 70% desorption. So uh, in conclusion, the applied current impacts how much gold can be desorbed and the mass of gold on the CNTs in the first place also impacts how much can be recovered. So we've uh, hypothesized this closed loop approach to um, capturing gold, producing a temporary electrode, resuspending the carbon nanotubes that have now been regenerated, 
and use them again for further adsorption. We've tested this in a few different cycles, about four, and the major limitation to the reproducibility of this or, or, or repeatability of this uh, cycle is the re-suspension of the carbon nanotubes in step five here in the lower uh, left-hand corner. The resuspension of carbon nanotubes is challenging and we're trying to overcome that with a few different material means. So overall, we've developed the feasibility of creating a um, separation mechanism uh, from CNTs that uses applied potential rather than strong acids. And we try to invent this closed loop process. So some of the things we don't know yet are what happens if you use these in real gold containing wastes? Will this work in mixed metal solutions? What are the confounding factors of other metals or other or, uh, organics? And we hope to develop uh, more effective ways of separating the CNTs from the membranes, from the temporary electrodes, and to test these on more realistic mining uh, uh, waste and electronic waste leachates, which is another thing that I'm hopefully going to learn about here in France. So with that, I wanna thank my group, which really did all the work. Uh, the group has changed over the course of uh, several years from being in person to being online to finally being in person again which is a very happy thing. I also want to thank all my funding sources, and I'm very happy to take four or five minutes of questions in the remaining time. Thanks again for your attention. Uh, as always, a pleasure presenting at BM at Bimmer. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Charles, for a great summary of uh, some really, really nice work. Um, Alex, are you going to uh, enable uh, questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay. So I've allowed people to unmute themselves and turn on their videos. So anybody who has a question can raise their hand and uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, Looks like Jacket Tan has raised his hand. Uh, hi, Charles. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, very informative and lots of great works. Uh, now I have a quick question. Um, based on the time, I have one question. Um, in your slide 20, you show the deposition, the reduction of the iron. Uh, it seems like you choose no ligand method to synthesize iron. I'm, uh, I'm curious, have you tried any methods with ligands and have you seen any nickel effect on the iron agglomeration? And the iron agglomeration, I believe, is an inter uh, is a interesting topic. And then the particle often have the ligands. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I didn't mention this uh, for, for lack of time, but there's been a lot of research on trying to prevent NZVI aggregation by uh, ligand methods, like you mentioned. So whether that's wrapping them with polymers or um, trying to uh, even bind polymers sometimes to the oxide shell. Um, so all those methods are, have been well studied for the past 20 years. Uh, some problems with them is that when you have a polymer shell around the iron nanoparticle, it reduces its reactivity and can also make it more difficult to um, if, for its transportability through, um, through uh, batch systems. So this is really a different approach, which is to try to grow the iron on the carbon nanotubes from its salt, from a salt precursor, again, in, in a reduction reaction. Uh, we haven't tried, oops, sorry, we haven't tried um, any further ligand approaches for this, uh, but if you have some ideas where you might not, uh, where you might not uh, quench the reactivity of the iron, but increase its overall stability or control its size, um, I'm very interested to, to hear. Do you have specific interest or, or experience with uh, ligand-based approaches? Uh, so the uh, ligand is also very important in the catalyst, and I believe and there are many similar research. Right now, I don't have uh, direct ideas, but I'm also I just uh, have a quick uh, follow-up questions. Uh, when we use iron to place the role, do we consider the activity and the active side on the nanoparticles? Um, so I can think on this way. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch the question. Maybe. Uh, let me be straight. Let me be straightforward. So, yeah. uh, do we consider active site on nanoparticles, and if maybe different active sites have different activity, 
uh, do we have this consideration? Mm. Oh, I see. Like in terms of different facets of the nanoparticle. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a detail we haven't examined. Uh, probably better to be examined by a, by a chemist than someone like myself <laughs> um, or, or a material scientist. But it is, it is an interesting idea, right? So that's actually what we've tried to probe a little bit with our bimetallic catalysts is how do different combinations of, uh, of, of metals either forming crystal structures or not, how does that change the overall surface reactivity? And it is very important, absolutely. Um, in this case, we simply wanted to demonstrate that we could create a zero valent iron nanoparticle on the carbon nanotube. Um, and then test its reactivity in, in some simplified systems. But actually, yeah, probing the optimization of nanoparticles is really critical. So I, I think that's, that's an important um, topic you brought up, yeah. Okay, thank you for answering. Yeah, thanks for, for the question. Good, uh, more, more things to research. Uh, we have Jim Britton. Hi, hi, Charles. Um, just a, a, an advertisement for uh, Bimmer. Um, Ryan Lewis has purchased a thin film diffractometer, which uh, will be installed as soon as it gets through customs. So that, that might have some application to looking at some of your materials. It's much more sensitive than any equipment we have in the lab at the moment. Okay, fantastic. So just, just so you know. I will send my students your way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, Alex, your hand is up as well. Yeah, Charles, um, I really appreciate this talk. This is a really nice talk. I think that you're doing some uh, very important work and are using some nice innovative approaches to uh, uh, tackling some challenging problems. Um, I do have a question, uh, although the, all the carbon nanotube work is great, and I, I think that we have lots of overlap between our, our interests there. But I had a question about your nickel copper um, bimetallic um, uh, catalytic system there. Uh, you showed some really nice data with the two metals and, and the nanoparticles, and you showed that you have different size particles depending on how you put them together. But I, uh, I'm just wondering how important is the size of the nanoparticles and can you control like in your third case where you co-reduce the nickel and the copper, can you control the size of those particles and is that an important factor to consider? Yeah, great question. Um, so size for sure is an important factor in terms of catalysis, you know, just surface area availability um, per mass of the material that you have in your system. Um, the, the size seems to be controlled by a few different parameters. Uh, we've just observed some preliminary data about the concentration of the salt that's used, the, um, the, uh, the density of the deposition of the salt before reduction with sodium borohydride. And in this case, uh, whether or not there's another metal that's nearby during the growth of the nanoparticle, which seems to inhibit the growth of one nanoparticle over another. Uh, we haven't done a full optimization of that study yet. That's uh, planned. Uh, uh, hopefully part of my uh, next discovery grant. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I do think that probing that parameter space is critical. Um, right now, we just try to keep the conditions as consistent as possible. So same concentrations, same flow rates, uh, same amount of sodium borohydride, same reactive reactivity rate uh, of the sodium borohydride. And then we observe this difference whether you pass the metal salts together or if you pass them one after another um, in, a, in a co or replacement reaction system. But yeah, the, the size for sure would have a huge, what I, what I thought was that because we had these very small copper nanoparticles of four nanometers, those are gonna be the more reactive ones. But actually this co-reduction system must have nickel copper doped systems that are difficult to differentiate. They're actually kind of like, we have to do this TEM analysis again, but we don't see any kind of crystal structure for the copper. Uh, we don't see any distinct phases between the metals. So it might be getting to a real doping, a doped system, uh, which probably has some kind of interesting electronic strain that uh, enhances this bimetal's catalytic properties. Because later on we see that 
you know, the, the co-reduced nickel copper, the one that doesn't have any distinct phases, is the one that has, had, has much higher reaction rate constants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Have you thought of using any other reducing agents other than sodium borohydride? It's just the easiest one we have. Uh, we and, and we're used to it. But if you have other suggestions that are less toxic and less expensive, we're all, we're all yours. Yeah, maybe not less expensive or less toxic, but others that are more reactive. Where you know, we should think yeah, about okay. that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, for sure. We can we can explore both uh, both angles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. That's uh, it's it's a really important consideration and one that's that's next on the to do list. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, one more question from Ali. I know we're running out of time here, or maybe overtime. Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Lenai. Great talk, thank you. Uh, just wanted to know uh, these nanoparticles, uh, bimetallic nanoparticles. Do they leach back into the water in a flow system? Have you ever? Yeah, um, good question. So Ali, thanks for the question. I, that's a really important consideration. So, <clears throat> you know, I always tout that when we are using nanoparticles, we have to do this responsibly. We have to minimize leaching. And so at the end of each of the experiments, I always get my students to do leaching tests. We have done leaching studies here and we do see a small amount of leaching. So it's less than 1% of the total amount of metals. Um, but there is still a bit of leaching, but that, that 1% uh, seems to be consistent over the course of about a day's worth of use. So we think it's probably, so, so what, what I mean by that is that the metals that leach occur early on and we don't see consistent leaching over the course of the day. So we think it's probably loosely attached from dislodged metals that haven't been fully uh, bound within this polydopamine system. Uh, and probably uh, we get to more of a steady state later on. Granted, it's a one-day study. It is not representative of what would happen in a real system. Uh, polydopamine is also kind of one of these chemicals that is used by researchers and is likely not gonna be taken up in large quantities by industry. So looking towards epoxide binding perhaps or some other types of bi uh, um, binding mechanisms might both enhance the stability of the nanoparticles and become more industrially relevant. But it's a, it's a really important consideration. Ali, thanks for that question. Okay, um, we are over time. So uh, thank you everyone for your active participation. Thank you, Charles, again, for a great talk. Uh, I'm gonna take 30 seconds and just promote our final talk in the seminar series. I just put it, the link in the chat, it'll be on uh, Friday, November 4th at 2.30. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Professor Jim McGrath from the University of Rochester talking about their work on developing ultra thin silicon membranes. Um, some really interesting work. I think that nicely rounds out this series. So again, thank you everyone. Have a great uh, weekend. <laughs>